All right. So, uh, so thank you so much for for inviting us to to share with you, and and thank you as always, Dave, for your kind words uh, about how we met and how we've been collaborating now uh, for uh, five or six years now. Um, and uh, and just what a what a genuine uh, honor and a privilege it is to to get to share our passion for psychological science with you, and uh, and I w also want you to get to know me a little bit and uh, about how I work and and some of what I'm interested in, some of my research and and uh, about me uh, just as more than that as as an individual. Um, and we can do a little bit of that toward the end. So, uh, so the you know Dave has been an incredible mentor to me uh, as uh, as he chose me as a successor, and uh, and it's a ten year process, um, and he's shown me a lot about uh, you know how to put a book together, how to collect resources, and so my process is very similar to Dave's. Um, you know, I you know we're constantly from the moment we get up until we go to sleep, we're constantly reading information and working on the book. Um, and you know, instead of having you know physical copies of of documents, I store them digitally. I use a program called Evernote, and so this is kind of my digital cubbyhole system. Um, so this will give you part of uh, you know what I have for for one chapter. I have maybe 400 articles for a chapter. Um, and this is where I store all of them. This is where I can, um, I can have access to them on my smartphone, any of my devices, it syncs them all together. Uh, and, um, and so that's where I, uh, I sort my information, where I store it. Uh, another thing that, uh, that I just briefly want to mention that both Dave and I are involved with is authoring not only the narrative text, but also uh, the uh, you know many of the resources that come with the text. Uh, for example, the assess your strengths activities, and we love these. I you know I teach intro to psychology on a regular basis. The, the large section, and these are some of the activities that my students enjoy a lot. It's how we can get them to apply psychological science to their everyday life, which I think in many ways is why students are taking the course to begin with. And so in these, we have uh, videos of ourselves talking, you know, uh, about, you know, posing, you know, thought-provoking questions to students. Um, we, and we have videos of us introducing the topic, uh, and then they're given an uh, opportunity to take a self-assessment, um, which we call Test Yourself. They're given their actual score on it in real time, which is great. Students love that. Uh, we give them an opportunity to understand how they can become better at that, um, how they can build on that strength. And then we give them an opportunity to be tested over that. Uh, uh, our approach to teaching psychological science is to use psychological science to teach it better. And one thing that we've learned is that repetitive testing improves learning and comprehension. Uh, and so this is something that is included in all of our activities and that this links directly into the grade book. And so that's, you know, how do you know if you're sleep deprived? This is one thing that many students uh, are struggling with. Uh, we talk about that in the book. Uh, and then also one is, you know, how much self-control do you have and why is this uh, worth working to increase? And, you know, this is a nice segue into some of the research that I do on self-control and how I think it's one of our greatest human strengths. You know, when you think of some of your personal heroes, you know, we all have them. Some of my greatest heroes were my high school teachers. Uh, my dad was one of my high school teachers. He taught high school uh, choir uh, for 40 years. And he was my choir director, and he motivated me and encouraged me in lots of different ways, and as did many of my other teachers. But I have lots of other heroes. You know, I think Oprah Winfrey is one of my biggest, uh, absolute biggest heroes. She has overcome tremendous adversity in her life. Uh, she's you know, persevered in the face of failure, and she's gone on to become uh, one of the most influential people uh, in the 20th and the 21st centuries. Uh, and then there's the rest of us. You know, uh, in the book, 
Uh, we talk a, a lot about how you can tell a lot about self-control by how people act around marshmallows. And this is made uh, uh, very poignant and clear in you know, a famous study, the, the marshmallow study, uh, where kids uh, who were in nursery school uh, at Stanford University many years ago uh, were given an opportunity, like this uh, young girl who was an actual participant in the study, uh, to have one marshmallow right now, or you can wait and have uh, two marshmallows a little bit later. What they did was they found that the kids who were better able and motivated to delay gratification, they tended to have uh, better psychological health, better physical health later in life, their relationships were a bit better, and uh, just they tended to have better outcomes. They got higher grades and things like that. We also have cases of, of people who, even if they're well accomplished in some aspects of their lives, they struggle with self-control in other aspects. So for example, we have General David Petraeus, who for decades was a model of self-control, but who in some aspects of his life came up a little bit short um, by falling prey to his urges and, uh, and kind of ruining his career as a result of that. But I think you know we have to remind ourselves that this applies to all of us. Self-control is really hard, and all of us know that. You know, in one famous study, they asked people if they had tried to control their impulses, you know, in the previous few hours. And what they found was that of the people who had tried to control their impulse, about half of them failed. And so that's a lot of failure going on. And so I think all that does is it speaks to uh, the difficulty that we have controlling our impulses. So we have to ask ourselves, why is this? Why is it that humans who have an unmatched capacity to control our impulses, why, do, why is it so hard for us to do that? And so, uh, so I just want to talk a, a little bit about that at three different levels of analysis, the individual, biological, and social. Before we get to there, I just want to talk about what, what we mean by self-control. Now, it has three different components, monitoring, standards, and strength. Monitoring is keeping track of your thoughts, your feelings, in your actions. This is weighing yourself on a regular basis. This is keeping track of how much money you are spending and how much you're earning. Standards, those are the benchmarks uh, that tell you what's appropriate and what's inappropriate. Now, we get our standards from a lot of different places. I think kids early on get them from their parents. Eventually, we get them from our culture. And eventually, we form our own personal standards and values and beliefs. But finally, and what I'll talk about the most is strength. This is the energy that's needed to enable us to have this desire to control our impulses. So why do people experience self-control failure? Well, I'm going to be using a model called the limited strength model of self-control, which really argues that humans, uh, yes, we have a, a tremendous capacity to control our impulses, better than any other animal that's ever lived. But it's very fragile. And when we use this power of self-control, it gets we get a little bit fatigued. And that can cause us to do things in other domains that we might not normally do. We might come to do things that we might even later regret. And so the first question that I asked was, you know, is self-control needed to override aggressive impulses? So when you read uh, criminology and, and, and other textbooks, uh, outside of psychology, uh, what people began to notice years ago is that a lot of violent crime was happening late at night. Uh, it's most violent crime, in fact, happens between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. Um, so very few people are acting aggressively early in the morning, first thing after having breakfast. It's usually when they're very sleepy. And so what was missing was this cause and effect. And so what we wanted to do is kind of make people mentally fatigued in the laboratory and see if that would increase their chances of behaving aggressively. So this is what we did. We had participants come into the laboratory for a case testing study. That's what we told them was it was about. And then by the flip of a coin, we told a random set of participants that they were going to eat a donut. And participants were very happy about this. Now, what we told them is that all that we want you to do is taste the donut and fill out the short questionnaire about how it tastes, its sweetness, 
its aroma, its texture, its dryness, and things like that. Then what happened was as soon as this participant began to take that first bite of the donut, the experimenter rushed and said, wait a minute, I made a mistake, you're not supposed to eat the donut. Don't eat the donut. Put the donut down. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave the room for a few minutes and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to fix this so that you can still get credit. Um, but, uh, I'll, but just whatever you do, just, just put the donut down and I'm, I'll fix this, I'll be right back. And then we left participants in the room alone with that donut for about seven minutes. So imagine what those seven grueling minutes were like. You now, you're looking at a donut that you were told you were going to eat, but now you're told you can't eat. We thought this would be very mentally fatiguing for participants. For the other half of participants, they're told the same thing, except it was about a radish. And so don't eat the radish. Now, we didn't think that participants would really, that this would wear them down that much. Now, after we did this, remember we wanted to measure aggression. So what we first wanted to do was we wanted to make half of participants a little bit mentally fatigued, and we think we did this with resisting attempting food. But then what we needed to do is we had to ignite an aggressive urge. And so at the very beginning of the experiment, participants wrote an essay and they shared it with someone that we told them was down the hall uh, as their partner in the study. In reality, the, it was a confederate working for us. So these were prepared beforehand. Now everybody was debriefed at the end of the study, but we just needed to, to include this so that we could ignite this aggressive urge. After that, participants uh, the experimenter came back and participants received negative essay feedback from this partner. Negative uh, numerical ratings and even a comment on the bottom of the essay that said, this is one of the worst essays I've ever read. And again, we debriefed people at the end of the study. People felt happy when they left the laboratory. This is a very standard way that people kind of make people frustrated a little bit in the laboratory. After that, we gave participants a chance to get back to this person who had evaluated them negatively. And we told them that they had to prepare a food sample for the person. Um, now, their partner expressed that they did not like hot and spicy foods. They weren't allergic to them. They just didn't like them at all. And then what we did was we gave participants a bunch of chips and some really hot hot sauce. And what they were supposed to do was dole out as much or as little hot sauce for their partner as as they wanted to, keeping in mind that everything they gave their partner, the partner had to eat. What did we find? Participants who were depleted of their self-control strength doled out a lot more hot sauce. 